Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Sandra Khan. Sandra Khan is an author and international lecturer on the topic of airway-centric orthodontics. Dr. Khan is currently the only diplomate of the American Board of Orthodontics that practices exclusively bioblock orthotropics and airway-centric orthodontics. Her approach is to treat the entire face and not just the teeth. Dr. Khan has been invited to serve on craniofacial anomalies teams at both Stanford University and the University of California in San Francisco. She began her work in orthodontics with a specialty in physical anthropology at the University of California in Berkeley, focusing her studies on human craniofacial growth and development. After 22 years of clinical experience in orthodontics treating thousands of patients, Dr. Khan was not satisfied with the traditional orthodontics as a solution for treating her own children. In 2013, she retired from traditional orthodontics to focus in orthodontics related to a healthy airway, with a concentration on paediatric prevention of long-term obstructive sleep apnea. Sandra's latest book, Jaws, co-authored with world-renowned biologist Paul R. Ehrlich, examines the hidden epidemic of malocclusion, or crooked teeth, and how it is impacting on our general health. The book is a must-read. With a foreword from Robert Sapolsky and praise from Jared Diamond, it's easy to see that this book is groundbreaking. It is a deep dive into the impact of poor oral posture on breathing, facial development, and health outcomes. Sandra is absolutely amazing and incredibly knowledgeable. I am honoured to have had the opportunity to speak with her. With all this being said, I hope you enjoy the episode. All right. How are you, Sandra? I'm great. Awesome. Um, I'd love to know a little bit about your background and, and how you how you got into this forward on ticks movement and, and the principles that govern, govern this, um, this idea. Well, the, the, my basic background is orthodontics. So I'm an orthodontist and like I explain in my book, uh, what happened is that when the time came for my old children to, to be ready for orthodontics, I realized that, you know, it could, it was good for everybody else, but it wasn't for my own children. So that was um, a little ethical issue that, you know, you can make money with it and it works out for other people. But then when it comes to your precious um, circle, then it's not good enough. So uh, my son had um, mouth breathing issues and started to snore and have some some issues with um, not sleep apnea, but I could I could see that he was going to go in that direction. So I started educating myself when it was time to treat my own son. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I read in, in the book um, that David Gozal of the University of Chicago um, estimated that between 7 and 13% of preschoolers um, snore and that 2 to 3% of um, them already suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. Um, which is incredible to think that our kids are suffering like that and we don't even know it. Um, so is this, is this condition on the rise uh, even in young children? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not a condition that's isolated. It's, not, um, it's, a, it's a compound condition. So it, there, there's a lot of factors that you know, predispose to it and uh, environmentally, it's um, there's issues like you know obesity, which is absolutely on the rise. And uh, I know you and your podcast are are um, really thorough with your nutrition um, stuff, and um, that's part of of the problem. It's all compounded, but it's it's a problem of modernity. It's the lifestyle that we're having that it's uh, causing this problem to be more prevalent in. And it's quite easy to to see that when you look at more traditional societies that are not as industrialized. Yeah, I I recall reading um, Weston A. Price's Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, and you you mentioned him in the book, and um, it seems like you've furthered his argument a little bit more, saying it wasn't so much what they were eating, but it was how they were eating and and the the types of foods that they were eating. So how does the type of food you know it's it's the the way it forces us to chew how does that um develop our face uh, in childhood 
Well, the, we don't really know 100%, but we can look at the clues. And absolutely, there's a mechanical part of what we're doing where as we came down from the trees um, and evolutionarily, we, we were spending a lot of our time chewing. And when we discovered fire and we started industrializing and then processing the food, we, the, the physical part of the, the process changed and it's been changing since then, um, more significantly after the industrial revolution. And, um, you know, anyway, from, from breastfeeding to the, the way we process food. So the food is practically pre-chewed and, um, it's, that's part of it. Uh, Weston Price focused more on the chemical composition of the food. So that's changed too. So there's a combination of both, what the, the richness of the composition of the food, but also the delivery and what you're doing in order to extract the nutrients. And we know the functions with saliva and with chewing and in physiology and anatomy, you, you use it or lose it. So the less we use um, our, our organs, and you know the mouth is certainly an organ the less you use something the the less it's going to be working efficiently so what kind of foods do you think we evolved to be eating to properly develop our jaw and and strengthen our tongue Mm -hmm. well i'm not a nutritionist but i i know that um we are um, we still have our hunter gathering genes and uh, as paul says we we live in a in a, we have hunter-gatherer genes, but we live in a McDonald's environment. So we're obviously not meant to, to be, you know, cutting out the nutrition or, or the nutrients in the foods and then isolating them and then, you know, delivering to the body. We need to um, be doing what hunter-gatherers were doing. And um, I've worked enough in anthropology to, to understand that you know, we we think that maybe hunter gatherers weren't that healthy, but they actually were. Uh, when I was talking directly to to Daniel Liberman and other paleontologists, they said, you know, stop saying that the hunter gatherers were were dying young because what they were not. If they had an accident, if they had an infection or something, they would die. But if they uh, uh, they didn't have a specific uh, problem like that, or if they sur- didn't survive childhood but if they did then they were living healthy lives into their 80s so we know that the you know we were doing things that were keeping us healthy and we certainly did not have what we call the diseases of civilization like the the diabetes and uh, you know some of the autoimmune diseases that we're dealing with so we consider those the diseases of civilization and uh, i don't think hunter gatherers were dealing with that and certainly I, I've heard and I always repeat that if we walk 10 miles a day, disease cannot catch up. And, and we know, we know um, as you've, I've, I've heard in your podcast, how you, you, um, you um, explain nutrition. So I know that this is quite um, something that your, your audience is familiar with, but we're designed, our brain is designed to recognize those sugars that were hunted and gathered in, in certain times of the year and they were scarce. So we were, you know, we we're wired to really, really look for those sweet um, foods like fruits and that were ripe. And that was part of our protection. So we kept ourselves safe because bitter things tended to be more um, poisonous, including like bugs are, were bitter and the, the things that were spoiled or, you know, already acid, they, they were not good to eat. So the sweetness gave us that extra protection. And because we were wired to really look for that sweetness, but it was scarce in our environment, then when we didn't, we, when we provided it in, in massive amounts, then we started breaking down and we refined sugar and we are wired to, to look for the sugar as addicts. So we've created this, this uh, populations of addiction and certainly with children the addiction to, to refined sugars is tremendous. So that answers your question of what foods you should eat. Mm. Think of cave, uh, cave times. Think of Michael Pollan. He says, you know, if your grandmother recognized it or great grandmother now, but if your great grandmother recognized it as a food, then eat it. 
if she didn't, then, you know, your grandmother wasn't doing, you know, 2% milk or reduced fat or artificially sweetened something. She was eating more you know, whole foods and things that have two or three ingredients and not, you know, things you can't pronounce in the label. So if the, those are pretty, you know, uh, straightforward rules to, to follow what to eat. From an anthropological perspective, do you think that our hunter-gatherer ancestors intuitively knew the benefit of chewing um, and hard foods, or was it just that those were the only foods that were around, so they didn't have a choice? Well, before we we were cooking our food, we didn't have a choice, and we spent a lot of our you know our energy in feeding, both you know individually and as a group. But you know, once we had choices, we would definitely look for the sweeter and the easier to digest foods, but they were not so available. So we had periods of, you know, fasting and, and the seasonal part of the eating was just what we had to do. Fermentation, I'm a big fan of fer- fermented foods, you know, the probiotics and all the, all the fermented foods. And they had to ferment some of the foods because we didn't have refrigeration. So in order to conserve some things, they would ferment them. So there were certain techniques or, or ways to treat our food that are designed closer to how the, the physiology works in our bodies. Absolutely. Yeah, I think fermented foods were a real breakthrough. I'm not sure who discovered them. I think it was like in Nepal or something, but they, were, they were, must have been very happy with themselves when they realized they could uh, preserve their milk um, as yogurt. But you mentioned before about how um, our mouths are sort of use it or lose it organs. You know, we we do have to um, chew and and make our jaw strong and our tongue strong as well. Our tongue's quite a big muscle, and we need to work it out. Um, but I wanted to talk about the nose uh, as a use it or lose it organ. Um, mm-hmm. As someone who grew up a mouth breather um, and struggled with you know a bit of congestion, you know, deviated septum. Sometimes it's hard to breathe. Uh, I realized after reading uh, all of Patrick McEwen's work that if I really focused on nasal breathing constantly, um, now I can breathe through my nose all the time um, and I never have it blocked and I never have any trouble. So what tips do you give people who come in and say, I just can't breathe through my nose. It's, it's blocked all the time. Well, yeah, there's several things in your, in your question. First, I'm going to address, um, you were talking about strengthening the jaw. Mm-hmm. And I want to cautious you of focusing on the easy scapegoat, with which, which is strength. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to really think about posture, and posture is not necessarily strength. So we obviously need to have, you know, a, strong muscles and we have to chew properly, but it's not necessarily what we do when we're chewing, but it's what we do when we're not chewing. So we are more interested, at least in my uh, scope of work and the people that I work with in the rest time, which is not when you're chewing. Chewing is important. I'm not saying it's not, but I would say it's not as important as what you're doing when you're resting. And we think of the tongue, you'd you'd say the tongue is a muscle and it's strengthening. And I don't think the tongue, it really needs that much strengthening. I think the tongue uh, as a hydrostatic organ that changes its its shape, but not its volume, uh, behaves more as a fluid than as a muscle. So it's not what the tongue does, but the tongue is taken for a ride. So if you swallow right now, you'll see that you, when you swallow, your tongue sucks itself to the roof of the mouth. And it's not muscular. It's what we call dynamic of fluids. So when you change that pressure and you develop negative pressure, and this is all part of our new book and the newest research that we've been doing, it's really that negative pressure that sucks your tongue, just like a suction cup. And that's not mechanical. It's not strength. It, if the tongue was just a fluid with no strength, it would still be pushed up or suctioned up. And in order to swallow, you need to generate that negative pressure. And it's not force. Your tongue doesn't push the saliva or the food down to the esophagus. It's that suction like a bathtub when you take out the, the, um, the, the, uh, the cover or whatever. And it's really fast and accelerates. So the suction is very strong. 
but it's not a muscular strength. And we have to start talking about this because I mean, Patrick McKeon is doing great stuff and uh, you know, stuff with Breathe and, and he's working now with, um, with James Nestor and all these people, but they're not bringing up the, the most important issue, which is that suction and the rest. And if we ignore that, then we're not going to be able to create uh, clinical practices that are conducive to developing better. It's all about the rest. So chewing, everybody knows you gotta chew. Of course you have to chew, but it's what you do when you're done chewing. And our GOPIX program is very focused on that pause after you chew. Chewing is just the, what we do to um, teach uh, children or whoever's doing the GOPIX program to develop that sensation of what you do. You chew your food and then you stop and then you recognize that pause. And that pause is teeth together, lightly together. The tongue should be suctioned lightly to the roof of your mouth. And when you, when you have suction inside your mouth, then your nose will be very efficient pulling in the air. Yes, when you have a, a problem with your nose, it's not gonna go away. And you cannot will yourself to breathe through your nose. Um, I haven't seen it. Uh, people like you claim that you have. Um, I see it in my patients. And when you are absolute, absolutely relaxed, you cannot will yourself to do anything because you're relaxed. You can't train to hold a certain posture that becomes second nature. But if you have a deviated septum or you have turbinates that are distended and or inflamed, or you have uh, tonsils and anodes are not in your nose, but if they're causing a physical blockage, if your jaws are too small to house your tongue as a hydrostatic organ, you're not gonna will yourself to breathe through your nose. Your nose is going to do what it needs to do. So we need to start addressing the nose and not just saying, you know, I can will my nose to do what I tell it to do. And uh, I've been uh, writing the new book called Nose, capital N, capital O for nitric oxide, mm -hmm. Nose. And I'm working with uh, Dr. Rangel, Jesus, Chavez, uh, Jesus Rangel Chavez. Uh, he's a um, pediatric ENT and neurologist. And he actually coined the term nocturnal nose. So the nose works in a certain way during the day, but then at night it changes and it's a different organ that has different functions and different um, requirements. So when you go to sleep, your nose will work differently. And with children, you have to have 97% on block nose or free nose. And you have to develop this and that is mechanical. You have to have a, a, a nose that doesn't have, um, the, the, where the air doesn't have resistance and you have to have good turbinates that allow the air to go in and you need to have the proper septum and you have to address that nose. And mechanically, we have to find clinicians that understand this and are willing to help our patients. I'm a big uh, proponent of fixing the, the foundations of the home and then working differently within that home. But if you don't change the architecture of the jaws and the nose, and sometimes you need surgery, but it needs to be done properly under the, the guidelines that will take you to, to, have, um, to foster good habits. So um, in that sense, you know, it's, it's interesting that people are now thinking that they can wheel their nose to just work, even though the nose might have a, a, a physical problem. Yeah, that's so interesting. So you bring up nitric oxide. Um, as an orthodontist, what role do you see, if any, I'm not sure, does nasal nitric oxide play in the health of the mouth? That's interesting. Um, nitric oxide, I don't think it has a specific um, function in the mouth. Mm -hmm. It has a function overall in the body. So it conditions the air and it allows it to be the, for the, the exchange of oxygen to be a lot more efficient. And that's obviously going to cause you know, benefits, internal benefits in the body. I don't think there's a specific mouth um, function and I know that nitric oxide is now, you know, in supplements and in different uh, areas, but the, the nitric oxide that we are concerned with is the one that's produced in the, in the micro sinuses. So as the air goes in through the nose, 
the sinuses, the mucosa in the sinuses produces a, the, this chemical and it conditions the air so that that air goes into your lungs and it's facilitating that, that um, exchange. So that's gonna make you overall healthier. Obviously, if you have your, your nose uh, working fine and your lips are closed and your tongue is lightly suctioned to the roof of your mouth, so you have the front and the back of your mouth closed, then your mouth is naturally gonna be healthier. Your teeth will be healthier. Your saliva production is going to be um, um, a, a, you know, accurate to, to, or, or efficient because the saliva has um, a very important function in keeping the health of the mouth, you know, moisturizing the, the tissues inside the mouth and also has a cleaning um, uh, function. So if you have saliva, the, the food and the, the sugars and the bacteria is gonna be washed from your mouth. So that's all part of how we work as, um, as a whole. And it's interesting because in, in our transdisciplinary um, work that we're, we're trying to promote, we, we're puzzled by the fact that we separated the mouth from the rest of the, the body. So you are a physician and you deal with everything in the body, the eyes, the ears, the nose, but when it comes down to the mouth, you separate it and there's a dentist, which is trained completely separate from the rest of the body. Uh, in Spain, where I've done a lot of work and where I teach, the, you're a stomatologist. So dentistry is or was, they now changed it, but it was um, people my age were trained as physicians and then they took the specialty of the stomatology. So these are people that had the training, the medical training, which really should be the, the way it is. We can't see the mouth as something separate from the rest of the body. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I really think that um, the book Jaws is a necessary companion for the books of um, James Nestor and Patrick McEwen. Um, I, it, it was much, it made the, those books make much more sense to me and really completed the circle. Um, and I really started to be concerned about my own oral posture. Uh, when I was reading the book and every time I was reading, I was just making sure that, um, you know, I had my mouth closed, my tongue was on the roof of my mouth, which I realized that I wasn't doing very often at all. Um, and, you know, I have quite a large tongue, but quite an, a narrow palate. So it's not, not the easiest thing for me to keep my tongue on the roof of my mouth. Um, and like you said, the suction actually helps quite a lot. Um, just to keep it there without having to think about it. So I guess maybe before we move any further, could you outline exactly what um, a, a healthy oral posture um, is? Is Well, the, I'm, as, as I'm talking to you, and I don't know if people are listening on um, just audio, but I can see that you have a lot of um, gesticulation, of movement from your lips and sucking, and um, you're doing a lot of extra stuff uh, with your mouth, with your lips, with the oral musculature. And an oral posture should be completely quiet. And in order for that to be completely quiet, it has to be self-sustaining so that when you completely relax, it, it stays the same. And for that, you know, we, we do use the, the tropic premise, which was um, uh, introduced by John Mew um, a long time ago. But he talks about having the teeth in light contact and the tongue. He, he talks about having the tongue on the roof of the mouth, but we talk about having the tongue lightly suctioned. And there is enough research, even from um, 150 years ago, um, Dr. Donders published the pressures. He was an ophthalmologist and he, he published the pressures um, in different cavities in the body. And he published the pressure in the, inside the mouth. And there's two separate compartments in the mouth. And the Donder space, we, we called it the Donder space in honor to Dr. Donder, who published in 1875, uh, 1873, sorry. He published uh, the pressures. And he talked about pressure inside that compartment to be minus 10 to minus 15 millibars of negative pressure. And just to get a sense, when you swallow, if you swallow right now, you put your teeth together and your tongue is suctioned. And that uh, generates anywhere between 100 to 200 millibars of negative. So this is a tenth of that strength. 
and you can learn to recognize it and hold it. So you need to hold that suction, but it, it has to be super light. So you're completely relaxed. And so your tongue will be in the roof of the mouth by itself, not by muscular force. And I repeat, by what we call dynamic of fluids, not mechanics of solid bodies. In physics, you make that distinction. The muscles work, the bones, they're all doing their movement through mechanics of solid bodies. And we talk about the tongue staying in the roof of the mouth through dynamic of fluids, just through that suction that's automatically generated without any expenditure of energy. And that's, that's been a, uh, something very interesting because when I wrote JAWS, I didn't know this stuff. I, I knew that the tongue had to be in the roof of the mouth, but it, I did, really didn't know how it, it would stay there. I thought, you know, if you just, you know, do it a lot, it would just stay there. And when I started recognizing that suction, and we now have some patents on, on appliances that help you recognize it. And then now we know that we can train ourselves before we go to sleep. And this is, this is really interesting. And the, the thing that uh, puzzles me, and it's so nice to have people like James Nestor, who's uh, uh, a, a journalist that can explain things better than we can. But I have people at Stanford. I'm, I've been um, looking at the work. I don't know if you know um, Philippe Morain, but um, I would ask you to write it down and check out his research. He's amazing. And mm -hmm. he's been doing research on sleep for several decades. Philippe Morain, um, and he does research with fish, and he was part of the team that isolated the narcolepsy gene at Stanford. He's brilliant, but he's a researcher, and he doesn't have, through his research, any recommendations for clinical um, uses of his research. And when I sit with him and we just talk about what he's doing, I say, you know, Philippe, what are you doing with this? How come you're not making any uh, specific uh, recommendations for clinical work. And he said, well, the, the people at Stanford, the clinicians are not interested. And one of the things he told me, and I'm going to look into it, is that all the sleep tests are actually irrelevant. So we put people to sleep. We look at the AHI. We look at what the Giminol to CJ was, was, CG was brilliant. And we look at what he came up with and we use it as a, as a way to diagnose and dictate treatment on our patients. And Philippe says, you know, he's working with fish with narcolepsy and he's studying sleep every day in his lab. And he said, forget looking at people when they're sleeping because REM and all these things are irrelevant. You gotta look at people during wake. You gotta study the brain when it's awake to see if the brain is actually working efficiently and it, if it did have a restful night. So you might have you know, sleep apnea and that's quite obvious, but you don't know how efficient your treatment can be with a CPAP or, or medication or whatever you're doing unless you test during wake to see if the brain is working as efficiently as it should. And so he's been looking at this in fish and we haven't been translating the research into humans. So now we have to get people like you who are doing these podcasts going like, okay, there is very interesting research. So how are we going to use this that we know as a fact and take it to the clinic so we can help children grow better or adults that are struggling with um, snoring or sleep apnea or people that cannot uh, tolerate the CPAPs? How can we come up with techniques and, and protocols that will help uh, you know, humanity? And this is why working with Paul Ehrlich is so fantastic because I tell you, he's one of the treasures of humanity. Uh, if you have a chance to interview him, he just moves from one area to another area and he's brilliant in, you know, he had a few years ago when we were writing Jaws, we met in Italy because the Pope invited him specifically to talk to him about the, the issues facing a humankind. And so he's, he's somebody that's, uh, that has recognized that we're siloing in, in our sciences. And he moves from one to another, trying to put things together. And his interest is really the human predicament. And um, from ecology, from, you know, we all know the example of, you know, if the bees disappear, then we're toast, right? So we all interconnected. And we 
need to get these researchers that are doing phenomenal research to connect with the clinicians that are honestly trying to figure out better protocols because what we have is not working, especially, especially for our children. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's not the first time I've heard that these, um, you know, sleep studies where you you look at, um, you know, brain waves and, and things while people sleep. It's not the first time I've heard that they're probably not as useful as they're made out to be. Um, but working in a sleep apnea clinic where the AHI is king, that's all you really look at. Um, what, what do you recommend, um, based on your conversations with Philip Moraine, um, you know, what could we look at during wakefulness that would give us an insight into, uh, sleep and sleep disordered breathing? I don't know. Right. That's what I have to, um, do a little more investigation on. Mm -hmm. Um, I know from the work that, uh, neurologists are doing and from what, um, we do with Robert Sapolsky and, and other people that are looking at, um, a stress that we can look at different things in the brain. I am um, working now closely with um, with um, uh, David Gozal. His wife mm -hmm. is a is a neurologist, and they're they're looking at sleep and children. And uh, you know, we just have to get together with all these brilliant people and figure it out, and um, and use a little bit more common sense. I think uh, common sense is sometimes missing the missing piece in all these um, these techniques. Um, with Philippe, I'm going to try to get something that we can extrapolate to the clinic from his research. Um, unfortunately, I think he's going to be leaving Stanford, so I don't know how much I'm going to get to work with him. But um, I definitely want to work more with uh, David Gozal and get some of our appliances into the kids that he's treating and uh, we know, for example, that maxillary expansion is critical. And I work, um, I've had surgery myself, and I've, I work exclusively with, uh, with one surgeon in Spain, um, um, Federico Hernández Alfaro. And I know that if we expand the jaws, the tongue has more room, and it makes sense. And if we don't have that uh, architecture in our jaws, we're not going to be able to, to improve that much. And the, we do have an, a, an appliance that we're um, using now with negative pressure that, that generates negative pressure and that calibrates for people that cannot hold that pressure because they don't have the, the width of their jaws. But we have to really understand what um, techniques are available and who's doing them well and that get more people to practice us and make it more acceptable. Because we have practices like, I remember when I first took my, my Buteco course and I thought about putting tape over the lips and that was thought almost like a child abuse technique. And then other people wrote about it and now it's a more accepted technique. I now look at it and I think it's quite useless. I don't think it has a lot of... Um, um, validity, I think it's better to generate the negative pressure as opposed to put a mechanical or a physical barrier. But now people accept that. And with surgery, my own daughter had surgery at 15. I've had surgery myself. And when you make the foundation of the house bigger, then the furniture fits better. And it's done well by people that do this in and out every day. They become very efficient. It becomes a less morbid pr procedure. Um, in the U.S., it's very expensive, and there's very few doctors that do it. So the, the procedure, I, I, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know what the difference is. But I know that my patients that go to Spain, they have a, a double jaw, nose, and chin surgery, and it takes 90 minutes. In the U.S., I have you know one expansion, mini dome, and it takes four hours. And I don't know what the surgeons are doing, but if somebody's doing this in and out every day, they become very good. And when they become good, there's less suffering for, for the, the patients. So we have to understand what to do in the sense of people that already missed the boat to help them get to where they have to be. Um, definitely, I, I work with this Dr. Rangel in Mexico, and he does minimal invasive um, radio frequency turbinectomy in very young children, two-year-olds. And when you get a two-year-old breathing right, then everything else is going to be fine. Um, but in the U.S., you can't 
that because the surgeries that we do here are much more invasive. And uh, in Spain, for example, it's not allowed to do a turbinectomy on, on a two-year-old child. It's completely out of the scope of work for, for an ENT over there. So we got to take the techniques that work and you know work with the people that are doing it well to accept them and bring them uh, to society, just like braces are accepted. And I think braces have a lot of negative uh, results or, or negative effects. I'm an orthodontist. I love orthodontics. I think our profession is at a point where we have the tools to improve a lot on what we're doing. Um, I love, um, you know, in this line and those uh, using the trays as opposed to using the brackets. So you have less of the side effects. Um, I know that braces tend to promote a poor oral posture. So kids that have braces in their teens, they tend to hold their mouth, even with the lips together. They hold their teeth apart, so they tend to grow down. So if we know those side effects, then if we need to use braces, we gotta show our kids how to not spiral down into the bad posture using programs like GOPEX and other programs um, that can help you. But we need to improve on the techniques that, that we have. And that's all you know, part of the transdisciplinary work where we have all these people, including journalists and people like, like James Nestor, who's actually taking all this mumble that we do and turning it in, into stories that can inspire people. So what you're doing with the, with the podcast, I think it's, it's also part of uh, one of the important parts on ch taking these this changes to improve um, the breathing, the growing and the health situation in their societies. Yeah, I really hope so too. And, you know, just hearing you speak about braces, you know, I've had braces and um, it was not the most pleasant experience, but you perfectly described everything that I went through when I had braces as well. Um, jaw hanging down, poor oral posture. Um, there's a, a great little um, picture towards the end of the book where uh, you show a before and after of this gentleman who's had braces. I think it's courtesy of um, John Mew. Um, mm. And you can see after the braces, his teeth look much better, but his upper airways have been restricted um, quite a bit um, to the point where, you know, they're almost, um, you know, it, it's like a completely different upper airway um, from before and after because it's been, um, I guess the jaw has been narrowed. Is, is that correct? So um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the pitfalls of, uh, of braces, because I think there's so many people that just have them in their teens and, and never think about um, what they might need to do to make sure they're, um, they're not developing poor habits um, because of the braces. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to speak specifically against a certain technique, but what I do like to say is you got to understand the, the negative side effects so that you can do things to prevent them. Certainly having braces during the teenage years, um, it's already published in, in, the, in the literature, in the scientific literature. That is when the, the worst uh, timing for vertical growth, facial growth uh, happens. So if you can keep the kids from having braces, let's say from 12 to 16, that would be ideal because that is the timing where you get more vertical growth. So you got to try to keep away from that. Um, if you use, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if I should say Invisalign because that's a brand, but if you use a, the type of braces that have a full tray and you can promote a nice closed mouth with, with contact and because they are covering all the teeth, you get less um, extrusion of the teeth. So you get, uh, you, you can do certain things um, to prevent or to minimize those negative side effects. Um, I'm not a fan of braces, but if you're going to use them because that's what uh, you have available, then you can uh, incorporate techniques like GOPEX and, and other um, you know, conscious techniques to rest properly and you know, try to do more expansion and, and types of expansion, because not all expansion is the same. You can do, I, I love the, the new semi-rapid expansion with the stage one um, orthotropic appliance. I'm not uh, practicing orthotropics, but I do use uh, on everybody, adults, children, 
for everybody the, the type of expanders, the semi-rapid expanders that use the plastic to stimulate the, the what we call contact resorption. Contact resorption actually changes the, the shape of the jaw as opposed to opening just the suture. So it's really changing the architecture. And um, in the photographs, you can see that you know pallets that are very thin and high become you know wider and, and flatter because that plastic is pushing lightly all day long. And then these these type of expansions you also last a short time. Same thing with braces. If you have you know a tooth that's you know rotated and you want to get it into place, you can make expansion first and then put braces for a short limited time to on 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 rotate those teeth and straighten them and then get out. So in and out very specifically for, for something. In, in my practice, we, we minimize the expansion protocol to anywhere from three to six months, no more than that. And John Mew uh, wrote about that in his book because you don't want to have expanders for you know, years or for a year and you do it and then the tongue becomes the, the retainer, not an appliance. So if you learn that negative uh, pressure, now we have our, our um, op-lock activators that help you recognize when the tongue is in that position. So if you have your expansion and then you get rid of it, and then you go to an activator that the, the way the activators work, you actually recognize when you're doing it right and you do it right for half an hour until it becomes second nature. So when you go to sleep or the rest of the day, when you're at rest, your tongue is doing the retention and it's continuing the expansion if you're young. So there's there's uh, lots of things that you can do with orthodontics that can improve on what we already have. So like I said, I'm not gonna speak poorly and there's lots, lots of adults. I am I was lucky, I guess poverty has its uh, benefits because my parents couldn't afford braces. So I, I never had braces. So when I had my surgery, I just went the direction I needed to go. I do consultations on lots of adults have had the wrong treatment. They've had their jaws moved back and, and their, their, uh, some teeth pulled or you know their, their, um, they wore the braces and their faces grew down and back so they have less room for their airway. So those are side effects that have to be undone. So now mm. we can, if we know that and, and we are mindful of those effects, we can do orthodontics by doing what we call forwardonics, which is bringing everything forward. And these um, procedures don't need to be done during the y- younger years. Like, is there still hope for people like myself in their in their mid twenties who who want to change the change their palate and and um, you know extend their nasal cavity a little bit? Well, that's a that's a difficult, a very sensitive um, area because we really need to focus on getting the two, three, and four year olds right. And um, I don't know if you know uh, the name uh, Fuster, Dr. Fuster. Um, he's a cardiologist, uh, head of my, Mount Sinai, and he he talks about fostering good habits in childhood. And he's talking about car- uh, cardiac health, mm-hmm. but his stuff really is is can be um, it relates to everything that we do. We got to get those four year olds to have the right habits, not necessarily for prevention. He doesn't like the word prevention. He talks. We're not doing prevention. We're doing fostering of correct habits. Yeah. And we got to get those kids to have the the right situation. Once we pass four, five, six years old we can't really just expect to, to do it by fostering good habits. And then depending on where we are as adults, we need to consider either surgery or, you know, the other technological um, uh, techniques that we can, we can find. I'm a fan of surgery because I do think if, if done well, we can create the situation that we would have had, had we had, you know, good breathing from day one. And certainly I think the nose is a, an ignored organ. Um, I, I, I send uh, patients to the, their ENTs and they come back and they said, you know, we're gonna take the tonsils and adenoids out. They were like, tonsils and adenoids are not in the nose. 
I need a nose evaluation. And then they go back and they say, well, go find an ENT that has a, a, a rhinoscope. And a lot of them don't even have it. And we have now, an, uh, uh, we developed a device that actually measures resistance in the nose. And it's an incredible device. Uh, unfortunately, we have the, the chip uh, shortage. So uh, we, we want to have it produced. It's patented and we want to produce, but they just quoted me 60 months wow. to deliver the chips. So I'm competing with the car companies and everybody else. But just to have a little device that measures uh, the resistance in the nose, you can immediately know if you have a deviated septum, if you actually have problems with turbine. And you can diagnose where the problem is in the nose. And then we can start introducing techniques like Dr. Rangel does the minimi minimally invasive um, uh, uh, turbinectomy and he uses uh, radio frequency. Um, so there's no, there's no, um, you know, uh, it's not a, a major surgery. So there's, there's things that we can do to address the nose. And the ideal is to address it early, but if you want to get um, to the point where your nose is working well at night, you need to address your nose and then you need to do the exercises to really start using your nose. But if you just, uh, um, if we don't have clinicians that understand how to help our patients with little trauma, then we're not going to uh, go anywhere. We're going to stay with techniques that are just uh, band-aids as opposed to, to addressing the underlying conditions. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And, you know, the nose is a very forgotten organ um, and it's very unfortunate because it, it pertains to so many different uh, aspects of health. Um, working in a sleep apnea clinic, um, we sell lots of CPAP machines and it kind of bothers me that we're not addressing the problem. Um, so what in your eyes is the problem that we're facing with this eruption of sleep apnea in, in the West? Like I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a compound problem. It has a, a lot of different um, uh, culprits from, you know, cooking our food to, you know, living indoors. And if we, if we look at sleep apnea, we figure out a, a way to create a, a, a system that insurance can recognize and they can measure the AHI and then they can give you an, a, a device that you can connect and put it on your face. So we have an, a, an easy avenue to, to proceed with people that have sleep apnea. I mean, Dr. Gozal was telling us in our last meeting that he's got kids in his hospital in Missouri that, you know, they're four or five years old and they're putting them in, in CPAP. And these are mostly obese children because he and, and you know, Robert Lustig here at UCSF, they, they have their practices are almost completely devoted to obese children just because of our problems with you know, uh, diet and activity and, and, and processed foods and you know, things that now affect children in, in the endocrine. And endocrinology system. So it's not just about diet and exercise, but uh, these obese kids, the only solution they have is to have a CPAP. And we're trying to say, you know, what about some jaw expansion? They're young and some of these hospitals don't have uh, orthodontists, they don't have dental um, within the, the hospital. So Dr. Gozal was telling us that in his hospital, he cannot prescribe expansion to patients that cannot pay privately for an orthodontist. So what he can prescribe a CPAP. So these four-year-olds are getting a CPAP instead of having expanders. So it's a, it's a interesting problem of, um, of uh, public health that needs to be addressed. And hopefully we can have some people that are looking at the medical system and making some changes so that we can incorporate teams to address this uh, compound problems. For adults like you, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do. And um, working in this last book that I finished on breathing with uh, Dr. Engelke, uh, he has um, a, a program to learn how to generate the, the suction, even for people that are not, um, that don't have the, the ideal um, anatomy 
or with in their jaws. So he we developed a, a system that helps generate the suction for the person so it maintains it throughout the night. And he also has an amazing splint that is designed by an ENT as opposed to a, a dental splint that's designed by a dentist. Because he's an oral surgeon, dentist, and ENT, he was able to design the splint and, and he uses uh, uh, endoscope to check inside your, your throat. So he designed his splint. Uh, it's a spherical splint. And I've just been learning to use it. I made one for myself. And it's amazing the difference when you are having something that's designed by an ENT because it opens your airway in a different way than what we've been doing as dentists. So that's my, my next step is to get more courses and more dentists and ENTs um, to recognize and, and become proficient on this type of new splints that, um, that, have, uh, that are being um, prescribed and designed by ENTs, not by dentists. The ENTs might not be able to do the mechanical part, but we can work in teams with the ENT that understands the nose, that has an endoscope and goes and looks at how uh, diagnostically he puts an endoscope in the airway and then adjusts the splint by watching to see exactly where the problem is. So there's, um, there's a lot of very, very exciting things that are coming up uh, to help adults because I understand that there's a lot of suffering and a lot of improvement. And another area that we're involved in is uh, wellness and athletics because improving the airway and the efficiency of your breathing can also make you healthier, even if you're already healthy. So the wellness area is also has a, um, an interest and in a lot of these new devices that we're using, we were testing last summer with swimmers, uh, uh, very high-end swimmers, and they were cutting down the recovery time by using some of these appliances and these splints. And they were, you know, I had a friend who uh, boxes and he says, look, if I can cut my recovery time, I can, I have three minutes to recover in the time I have to fight again. So if you can get me something that can help me cut my recovery time, I'm all in for it. And this is not somebody that's suffering with sleep apnea. It's somebody that just wants to be more efficient with his uh, health. So there are lots of lots of interesting uh, clinical um, uses for what we're coming up with in, in our book. Uh, that we finished with Dr. Engelke is outlined a lot of this stuff. That's fascinating. Yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to where this field goes because I think, mm -hmm. yeah, C CPAP is not that does not seem like the final um, the final product that we should be using. It may be helpful, but uh, I think we should be looking looking forward a little bit further. I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about wisdom teeth. Um, seems like lots of surgeons just want to get in there and take them out. Um, I've had, I actually haven't had my wisdom teeth out yet. Um, but I've had one surgeon desperately wanting to get them out and tell me all the bad things that are going to happen if I don't. Um, so what, what's your, what's your take on getting wisdom teeth taken out? Obviously there are some, uh, times when that's necessary, but, um, uh, are they, is it necessary all the time to take them out? Look, well, they, every part of our body has a function and, if they can fit properly and function, they should stay in. The problem is that we've developed these uh, industrialized jaws that just don't have room for them. So we have to take them out. Ideally, um, what Dr. Wong talks about is to have a treatment plan with children that provides for 32 teeth. So when they come in and we're making a plan for their life, we have to make sure that we create the room for 32 teeth. That includes the wisdom teeth. But right now we are making uh, treatment plans for 28 uh, teeth. So the, the wisdom teeth are considered, you know, um, in Spanish we say desperdicio, like, you know, they're, they're waste, right? So we need to change the, the, the situation to make room for them. And sometimes if you can figure it out to how to keep them, that's great. But even in my son who's had orthotropics and, and tons of rounds of expansion, he's got one wisdom tooth that doesn't quite have room. And I'm trying to get it in. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to. He's only 21. 
but um, when you don't have room, they have to go because they can, can they can create problems. Same thing. I get questions with tonsils and adenoids. Should they take out? Should they, they once they are a problem and they're hypertrophied, something they have to take, they come out because they can't get back to normal. So same with with them. Please. If they're uh, causing a problem, then they have to be removed. Um, they are removed more than they should, just because we think we don't give it a second thought. But if you if you have to take them out, then um, you might have to, or you risk having a, a a problem down the line. But every case should be evaluated independently. Interesting. Um, there's a lot of work in the book. Um, that you obviously have uh, corroborated with Dr. John and Mike Mew, um, who are very interesting uh, characters in this field and they seem to have done a lot of the pioneering work. Um, I was wondering if you'd met them and, you know, what, what are they like? <laughs> They're fantastic. I adore John. I think um, he should get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but, um, and he's getting up there. We have a meeting coming up uh, in, in, um, in Poland soon and um, I hope to see him again. I've I lived in Spain for two years and I, I made the point to go to um, London to his practice every single month when I was living in Spain. So I've done a lot of work. I translated his book to Spanish, The Cause and Cure of Malocclusion. Um, and um, I, I have incredible admiration and he's the last stuff that he's uh, written. It's it's incredibly visionary. So um, he's amazing. Uh, Mike does a lot more of the, of the um, information and the social media and all this. And, you know, he's very focused on the chewing and his mewing stuff, which I don't think it's such an important part. But, um, but he's definitely informing the, the public, informing the public in, um, in a lot of this um, techniques and, and, and at least having awareness that there's something more than what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. It's unfortunate because I've read a few um, articles written about them that they're, you know, crazy and they don't know what they're talking about. But, you know, I've, I've read quite a bit about them and it seems like they really know what they're talking about. And it's just um, reading your book makes it sound like they, they really are onto something and um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully they can continue to get a bit more recognition. And, um, I mean, their work speaks for themselves. Some of the images in, in your book, I mean, it's worth buying the book just to see some of these images because mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that, um, you can achieve these sorts of, um, transformations, um, just by, um, you know, doing these relatively simple compared to, you know, all these braces and all these big things that you might have put in your mouth in decades past, but, uh, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating stuff that you and, and the, the, the muse are doing. So I know you've got a patient coming up soon. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, what sort of tips, what basic tips could you give anyone who might not have thought about the way that they breathe or where their tongue goes or, you know, how they sleep, you know, what are some basic tips you can, you can leave everyone with so that they can, um, improve their breathing and their and their oral posture. Well, the the first thing is to be mindful. If you are mindful of using your nose more and you know resting with your teeth together, with the relaxed lips and you know chewing your food and then making a pause and being mindful of how you're swallowing and after you swallow where your tongue goes and then trying to hold your tongue up there. I think being mindful is the first thing. And certainly if you have uh, access to young children or you have young children or nieces or grandchildren um, to make sure that they, we slow down and we help them develop a better posture and we give it the importance that it should have. It's not only about what you do, but also what you don't do and have, you know, give kids the, the right chairs for their size and, you know, have them, you know, um, you know, John, John talks about, you know, old fashioned, um, you know, uh, education and just telling kids to sit with their mouth closed and to be quiet and to sit in their chair with good posture and, 
you know, don't let them, you know, go around eating and, and, and walking around, but sitting at a table and chewing. The one thing that I learned from John, and I am absolutely um, convinced that he's the first person that looked into this, but he's totally right, is um, the most important part is weaning, not necessarily breastfeeding uh, the babies, but how we, um, how we introduce solid food and to not use a spoon to feed our children. And when you use a spoon, you teach bad posture. So we need to let kids grab the food with their hands. And the critical time for weaning is like from 12 to 18 months. And that time they should not be force fed with a spoon. After 18 months, they can use a spoon, but between when you introduce food all the way to to when the, um, the teeth are fully um, the full dentition, the early dentition, which is around two years old, that should be a time where kids should not be uh, spoon fed, because you put a spoon in the mouth and you um, you break down the the ability to suction and to create that close compartment. So not using a little spoon and having good posture for children and also for adults. But the the posture is is important. Be more mindful of your nose breathing and you know, resting with your mouth uh, fully closed. That's wonderful advice. I, I can't thank you enough for taking some time to speak with me today. I will definitely keep in touch because I'll definitely be wanting to pick your brain and um, right. definitely be wanting to read the new books as they come out. Um, I can't encourage uh, enough to everyone to read this book. Uh, it's top five for me, absolutely uh, must read. Thank so uh, thank you so much and we'll definitely keep in touch. Sandra. All right. I I appreciate and I thank you and your audience. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed our conversation. Once again, I cannot encourage you enough to grab a copy of Sandra's latest book, Jaws, The Story of a Hidden Epidemic, co-authored by Paul R. Ehrlich. It's absolutely phenomenal and eye-opening. I've left a link to Sandra's work in the episode notes so that you can find the book directly from there. She has also told me that there are two more books coming out shortly, so make sure you keep an eye out for those as well. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can subscribe on Spotify and YouTube and leave up to a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This is a simple, no-cost way to support my work and help me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave comments on my YouTube channel as well, as I do try and read through as many as I can. I've put links to all of my social media platforms in the episode notes if you'd like updates about the podcast, information about health, or if you'd just like to reach out to me in general. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.